Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Q3FY22 Earnings Conference Call of Natco Pharma Limited, hosted by Investec Capital Services. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Anshuman Gupta, Lead Pharma and Healthcare Analyst at Investec Capital Services. Thank you and over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, moderator, and good morning, everyone. On behalf of Investor Capital, I welcome you all for Natco's Pharma Q3 FY22 earnings call. Today we have senior management team represented by Mr. Rajiv, uh, Vice Chairman and CEO, and Mr. Rajesh. Um, over to you, Rajesh, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Anshuman. Good morning and welcome everyone to Natco's conference call discussing our earnings results for the third quarter of FY22, which, which ended December 31st, 2021. During this call, we may be making certain forward-looking statements or statements about future events, and anything said on this call which reflects our outlook for future must be reviewed in conjunction with the risks that the company faces. I'd like to state the material of the call, except for participant questions is the property of NATCO and cannot be recorded or rebroadcast without NATCO's express written permission. We will begin the call with results highlights followed by an interactive Q&A session. Okay. So we hope you all uh, received the financials and the press release that was sent out earlier. These are also available on our website. NATCO has recorded a consolidated total revenue of 590.7 crores, which includes a product licensing income for the third quarter, which ended December 31st, 2021. This is against 386 crores for the same period last year. So reflecting 53% increase in revenue. The net profit for the period on a consolidated basis was 80.4 crores as against 63.4 crores same period last year, reflecting an increase of roughly about 27% in net profits. During the quarter, there was a one-time expense against the product licensing income. Specifically on the segmental revenue split, which has also been shared, APIs totaled 61.7 crores for Q3. Formulations domestic, so about 100.3 crores. Formulation exports, which includes profit sharing, licensing income, and also the foreign subs, was 383.1 crores. Other operating and non-operating income, 45.3 crores. Crop health sciences is 0.3 crores for the quarter. Thank you all. We'll open up for questions now. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Tarang from Old Bridge Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, good morning. Just a couple of questions from my side. One. Uh, I think at the uh, beginning of the third quarter, uh, Natmos bought about uh, the 100% stake in Dash for $18 million. So just wanted to get a sense on the thought process behind this acquisition. How does it help Natco as you move forward? That's number one. Number two, uh, if you could uh, give us a sense on uh, the revenue and uh, EBITDA X the product licensing income, which is a one-off for this quarter. Thank you. Okay, so let me answer your first question. What is the rationale for doing a front end in the US? 
I mean, we've been doing partnership all these years, and I think uh, we have done well. I think we're much a smaller company when we did this partnership, so we needed someone to support us. So I think the strategy now is for the plain vanilla generics, I think we want to do our own front end. For complex generics, we want to continue to do partnerships. I think that's what we're thinking. So we needed a front end. I think Dash came along and came at a very reasonable valuation. So we thought, I think it's a, uh, it's a high time that we start doing our own front end. I think the, the value clearly is that, uh, you know, uh, as business gets more and more difficult, as you know, it will be better to keep most of the economics with us as opposed to sharing because there's not much to share anymore. And that's the reason why we did the acquisition. And also it allows us to brand ourselves in the front end market where, and we're moving up the value chain. Okay, that's answering your first question. Uh, the second question was, uh, what is the difference in uh, the EBITDA uh, if you remove the licensing income? The licensing income covers most of it, uh, uh, most of the expenses. I think our run rate of revenue is similar to what we had last quarter. I think I can't tell you exactly what the numbers are, but I think it's continuing the same way. Uh, I think the difference essentially is from the licensing income because we did uh, a licensing income with a particular partner. Uh, who gave us a reimbursement of certain expenses. I and mean, that's the reason why he had this one off. So I think to answer your question directly, I think there's no difference between last quarter and this quarter. Uh, so in, in, in the build Correct. If you remove uh, the one. Just, yeah? okay. just to step back on the uh, on the first question, right? I mean, I mean, uh, given that uh, your strategy is pretty straightforward about plain vanilla genetics uh, and wanting to do a front end there, Right. Would you rather not uh, be better off actually partnering with someone who has a broader portfolio in the front end rather than having your own front end with a, a limited portfolio? I think that's what we're trying to see. Problem is a chicken and egg question you're asking me. See, basically what happens is when will I get the broader portfolio unless you start something, isn't it? I think this is a long journey, my friend. I, I don't think the asset, the payoff of this asset will happen anytime, any, 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 anytime soon because uh, e, because all the products that we have right now are all licensed and they all have five year, seven year contracts. So we can't really get out of those contracts, right? So we can't get the ANDAS back. So clearly in the near term, it's only ANDAS for which we are filing now, for which where, let's say launch will happen five years, seven years or eight years later. That's when we get the uh, the payoff. Um, partnerships and all, there's not much to share, honestly. I mean, US has become extremely difficult. Uh, um, there's not much to share. Like nowadays, if you do a product, uh, it's even hard getting licensing deals now. Once there are more than three or four generics, it's very difficult to get licensing deals. Lot, there are a lot of standards which are sitting in a, with us for which we don't have a licensing deal. And even if you don't have a licensing deal and you want to go direct also, there's no margin. Yeah? So that's how hard the business has become. So this licensing model where there's a lot of competition doesn't work. I, I think that's more or less what we have come to, I think. Sad but true, that's what it is. Complex and sole generic, yeah, it works. What you're saying might work, but somewhere you need to choose your own destiny, right? I mean, uh, you, you, have to, you have to make your own destiny, so to speak. So I think you have to make that call. I think you have to make that call. I mean, I've been differing the decision for many years. I think now I decided I think we should do it. But I think, again, we have, there's a certain nuance to it. If it's a very expensive and uh, where there's like the expenditure is like 10 million, 20 million type of uh, R&D expense, that we want to outsource. Sorry, out partner out. But for the simpler ones, we'll do it ourselves. Okay? Got it. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next question, please. Yes. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Emmet from Unify Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, sir. Just one question. Uh, how is the competitive scenario in Canada for RevLimit, uh, considering how the how the market share gains and the uh, uh, pricing erosion? Price erosion has been, I top of my head, I don't remember, but it's been quite uh, anticipated because there's been, uh, as per anticipation, it's been fairly uh, competitive. I will not say there's some margin. Uh, we have done well. I, I can't recollect uh, uh, the market share, but I think we have done well. I think we're in, uh, we have done well. That's all I can say. Uh, I give you more color to it. I think once uh, when we just launched it last quarter, so we're not having clarity on how much market share we have. But we have done well, and I think uh, and the subs have done well. So both Canada sub and uh, Brazil sub have been profitable this quarter. So I think uh, the Canada sub has extremely done well, partly because of revenue. So overall, I'm happy. 
Erosion has been quite a bit. I think it is not, uh, you know, uh, but not unanticipated because there were multiple approvals. You had us, you had Red Days, you had Apotex, and then there was the authorized entry from Sandor. So, so I mean, it's fairly competitive, but it's okay. I mean, am I happy? Yes, yeah, we are happy with how things have worked. Okay, okay. And sir, what was sequential jump we have seen uh, in the export formulation business from 190 crore to 380 crore? Is it mainly because of the one-off licensing income? Partly because of the one off, yes, absolutely correct. Okay, okay, fine, fine, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Next question, please. Thank you. So, next question is from the line of Ankur Shagarwal from Search Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Uh, based on the comments that you made around the Canada market for Red Limit, uh, and since our launch for the US is very near, so how do you think that would play out given that there are same kind of competition? I mean, all the players that you mentioned, Canada, going to be launching in US as well, right? So how do you see that playing out based on our experience on the Canada side? I think uh, there's a difference in your US and Canada. So US, I think we are going to be the first generic uh, and we're going to be the only right. generic. Okay, that's the start. Okay, right? And uh, right. So, so I think that's probably the biggest difference. Uh, and it's a still a REMS product, so the reimbursement will be, uh, you know, the, the, there's a certain cost of selling the product because of the REMS. So it will be a little more different from uh, Canada, where it was all the genetics came in at, at the same time, so which is different from uh, US. Right, right. But after the 180 days, uh, the competition would come, right, like how it is in Canada. It will come, but again, see, uh, they'll come, uh, when they'll come and all, I, I, again, I, I have no answer to that question. I, from what I understand, again, uh, that they'll come in a staggered manner. So, uh, I think that's a question I can't answer, my friend. I think, let's see, when they come with, and, uh, okay. but I'm very bullish about the product, and I think we should do well with this product. Right, right. So, and lastly, uh, have we started supplying the, for revlimid in the U.S., like, we have, yeah, we are already stocked, my friend. We are already stocked. Uh, so we are already ready with the product. We already given it to Teva, and uh, okay. uh, and uh, Teva is ready to launch. And I think, uh, as we have announced in the past, uh, the launch date is in, in the month of March, so which is yes. in the next uh, next month. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. Thank, okay. You. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Danish Mystery from Investor Forced Advisors. Please go ahead. Hello, uh, hi, good morning, and uh, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, I just uh, had uh, two questions. One um, was on the domestic business uh, uh, that you have. You know, so last quarter you had mentioned that it seems like it's flattening out, and, and it has. So, we you know, when do you see uptick in the uh, uh, domestic business? Uh, that's question number one, and I'll come back with question number two after that. Okay, so I'll answer your question number one. So. Domestic, see, I think we started the year very nicely because we had the benefit of the COVID portfolio. So that particular month, the June quarter, because of the Delta variant, I think the domestic did extremely well. And I think the benefit of COVID was not there in subsequent quarters. I think that's why you see a dip. So the, this is without COVID, our run rate is about 100 CR a quarter, uh, my friend. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the numbers are. But whenever there's a COVID spike, then the sale goes up a little bit. But otherwise, that's a base sale that is there. Um, See, to answer your question about base business and all, I think, see, domestic, you know, we have, we are obviously present only in limited spaces. So I think that's the reason why we're unable to grow. I think it's something that we have been working very hard on. So I think we have a good portfolio. I think things are not, things are stable, okay, let me put it. Things are stable, and then we tend to have these one-offs because of COVID. So overall, the business has done well. But I think the predictability of business is not there as as much as you know, you know people like in your market like to have yeah so that is there and we're trying to address that by expanding the portfolio and uh, so that's one answer that's, does that answer your question uh, i was trying to understand more on the onco side because uh, i remember you know basically because of uh, of the covid lockdowns you know a lot of patients could not kind of uh, go for their uh, uh, onco has been stable my friend i think onco has been relatively stable i think we are happy with how onco has done all the price erosion uh, all the covid issues have been resolved but see this covid is a tricky one yeah. so i mean for example january was a bad month you know mm -hmm. because of covid uh, because of uh, I mean, the impact of it, was it as bad as, let's say, 
like in uh, delta but uh, mm-hmm. hospitalization was lot less because you know, i mean the you know it was obviously not as bad as delta but obviously there was some impact for few few weeks but this uh, uh, this pressure will be there i mean i mean we have to live with covid no i think uh, there is nothing we can do but you will have one or two ups and downs but overall if you take a, a 12 month mu you know it's a fairly stable business got it got it okay understood and yeah uh, got it and the question number 2 was essentially uh, with regards to your agrichem business if i see your segmental results you've uh, you you know had a 10 crore uh, ebit loss uh, which is there so is that on account of uh, salaries or is there some other one off expense and does that equate to the other expenses jumping up from 8 crores last year to about 24 crores uh, this year um we are losing money in agro i mean there's i mean there's no way of two ways of saying that and at consistently we are losing and we're losing about 10 12 crores a quarter see mm-hmm. i think uh, the launches that we anticipated didn't happen as you're aware so mm-hmm. i think uh this division was and i think that's the reason why we're getting a lot of pressure on our base and it so and i think uh this won't get better i think uh, conservatively uh you know our big launch of uh, chloran tetrog won't happen because court decision is unresolved so conservatively you know uh, it remains unresolved then uh, uh we can't launch before august of 2022 so a difference in a swing see that 10 crore ebitda loss if you have to swing it let's say if you swing 20 crores uh, in that particular quarter then you have a 20 crore improvement in the domestic business because you're covering up a 10 crore loss and a 10 crore drop so to speak let's assume we get a 20 crore ebitda because of the loss so i think that is very critical for our improvement of base business and uh, i think that's um, but it is what it is i mean uh, you know we make uh, and i think we just have to wait for this outcome to happen and also agro is very tricky because it's not uh, last quarter we had better sales than december quarter because uh, the product that we had was for cotton and it was it can be only sold between july and september so mm-hmm. you know like uh, so this you don't get consistent sale in all quarters so that also is there so uh, understood Yeah, but okay. overall, I mean, to answer your question, yes, there's a loss, and the loss will continue until my view till the September quarter. Okay, got it. And and the other expenses bit, sorry, last one if I can just squeeze in the eight crores to twenty four crores. Sorry, say that again. So other expenses. The, uh, other, other expenses jumped from about eight crores to about twenty four crores uh, uh, this quarter. Uh, so just wanted to check um, the reason behind that. Eight crores to twenty four crores. Yeah, I not it's not eight, my friend. It's two hundred forty-seven. I think eighty-eight. Oh well, yeah, okay. I may have got the uh, yeah. Yeah. No, this is related with that one-time and the expenditure. No, I think we have explained that at the beginning of the call. The general expenses are in that same region, and I in the same hundred crores per quarter kind of region. This is a one-time expense related with that particular product. Okay. Okay. okay got it. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Reminder to the participants to ask a question in the star and one. The next question is from the line of Kunal Randeeria from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, Rajiv, uh, just to pick up the previous participant's question. So your domestic oncology used to do, I think, around 100 crores a quarter. I think around two or three years back, right? And now my sense is more like around 70-ish crores or something like that. so maybe if you can sort of break it down how much of it was because of competition how much because of business loss due to covid or there any other factors i peak maybe did like maybe like 85 90 kuna i mean again i you have one quarter but average is about 85 90 now just settle around that number you're absolutely perfect um the reason why we see a decline are on co i think the two three reasons covid is a one time thing i mean i don't want to attribute everything to covid i think the biggest problem we have in the business are two fold one is uh is the price control so earlier we used to have uh, x amount of margin and because of price control there is a certain drop in the base business and two is because of competition we had couple of generics which did extremely well which have faced uh, competition i think one particular example i can give you is there's a product called sorafenib for which we had a compulsory license we ran that generic where we were the only generic for almost 8 years so once more competition came in obviously the brand declined so that, these are the two major factors that made all the difference but just still a stable business i mean i'll not complain that you know it's still a very profitable business for us i mean you know 
we do, you know, to, you know, uh, to, 250 to 300 crores of revenue in that division with practically 60 or 70 boys. So I think it's a, I mean, it's like a, you know, it's a cash cow for our, for our domestic business. But growth is a challenge, as you rightly said, and I think we're looking at new launches. We always have new launches. Last quarter we launched uh, three products. I think uh, we have launched Tiparacil for Stripe Protein, where we're the only generic. Uh, we launched Atacitrin tablets, where there's more competition. We launched Cabazitrin, uh, where we launched it's a multi-source generic. We launched Azofenib. So, I mean, it, these are launches that we've done in the last three, four months. I think it's a good business. Uh, it's just that, you know, I just challenge for us in domestic is, is that we are too concentrated only on one or two segments. I think challenges we need to expand out. And I think we have done a little bit in cardiology. So, uh, so we are trying to expand. So, I think, I think it's a, it's a, it's a long-term game. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. But, uh, Rajiv, I mean, I mean, what are the challenges in growing this? Is it because the competition is extremely, you know, aggressive in pricing? Well, I'm sure the market, the volume would be growing. It's pricing. See, the problem in oncology is the discounts are very high in, uh, there's a gross price and there's a net price. No? So I think there's always a lot of uh, discounting that you need to do and the limited number of institutions. And uh, so if you uh, lose few accounts, then there's a dramatic decrease of uh, sale. So I think... I mean, there's a, it's a structural issue, you know. I think even domestic, I mean, overall the sector has done extremely well. But our portfolio being a niche portfolio, we see more pressure. But uh, I think what you said is right. I mean, one is the competition. I think competition is probably the biggest reason why we, we don't see much growth. And see, what happens in, it's not like, you can't compare it with, you know, like a diabeto, you know, like a more stable therapy kind of setup. Because that has more volume and more spread out. So if, let's say you lose one tender in two, three hospitals, then it has a dramatic impact on your brand, you know. It's not like an antibiotic or a cardiology product where the prescriptions are more widely written. So then the, the you know, volatility of earnings is not as much. So I, I don't know if that answers your question. But yeah, that's broadly, I think that's how, uh, that's how I would judge that business. So I think, how do you get out of this? I think the way you get out of it is you expand your therapies. And I think that's the only way you can grow. Sure, sure. Uh, just one accounting question. Uh, so, how should we sort of assume? Uh, should we sort of assume some profit share from Rev Limit in the fourth quarter, or will that come from Q1 FY23? The launch is in Q4, so there's no doubt about that. So, there'll be some. Uh, hopefully, there'll be some profit share uh, in March, and then every quarter will will be getting profit share thereafter. So, that will become a you know significant part of the earnings. So, uh, so I think then. When it comes, I think, uh, you know, we will see how the takeoff is. I think at this time, I don't want to, uh, you know, tell you how much and all, but I think we'll have a good start. So, as you know, we're the only generic, so I think we should have a very good start. And I think we should do well in the coming few quarters. Sure. Thanks, sir. You have a few more. I'll get back in the queue. Are you sure? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahul Veda from Abacus. Please go ahead. Hi, Rajiv. Uh, so in the earlier comments, you mentioned that X of the licensing income, broadly Q2 and Q3 would be similar. So now, uh, so if we do a little bit of reverse calculation, whether it's uh, Revlimit Canada or Affinitor or Zotress, then there's been no impact of any of these molecules. So again, just trying to understand what is uh, the cost to have these molecules. Down the domestic and the other businesses have gone down, which have been just been offset by these launches. So, uh, so, so the question is why the business is not growing. Is that the question? Yeah, even after the launches. <laughs> no, no, I understand the question. I mean, I'm just saying it the way it is. Yeah. It is not growing. I mean, that's, that's a fundamental challenge that we have in our business because, see, our, we have a very expo heavy exposure in the U.S. And, uh, and we have seen, like, the, broad, the products that used to make good money for us are not making as much money as they used to. For example, Dr. Rubison used to be, you know, a uh, hundred crore profit share every quarter, you know, every year, sorry. So that has dropped dramatically, you know, so because of more entrance. So we are seeing more competition in other smaller products. So that's the nature of the business. I mean, that's all I can say. I, I, I don't have an answer to your question. Uh, uh, I think you just have to hope uh, the new launches will come and then hopefully they do better than what you've done in the past and then you can offset the loss. And uh, so I think, uh, as as you discussed, I think level limit is going to be a very criti critical one, which will give us growth. Sure. And uh, any update on uh, Nexavar and Imbrivika? 
Uh, in Brubica, I don't have a legal update. Nexaware launch and all, we'll discuss closer to the date. I, I, I'm, we're not at, uh, we're bound by confidentiality uh, 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 not to discuss about the launch at this time. But uh, when we're coming closer to the launch, we'll discuss. But uh, just any rough estimate over the next 12 months I or 18 answer. months? No, I, I can't answer that question. It'll happen. Uh, I will discuss when we're closer to the launch. Yeah. Thank sure, you. sure. Fair point. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ritika from ValueQuest. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, sir, uh, what uh, I understood was uh, QOQ growth and income was completely offset by the QOQ growth in the other expense and which was due to this licensing uh, product. Could you explain more about what products did we in license and what is the future uh, outlook of uh, uh, these products? I think what we have done, I think as a, at the beginning of the call, uh, we have already said what these, uh, the nature of the, the complex products we decided uh, uh, that we would, uh, you know, do through partnership. So essentially the income was a reimbursement of uh, costs. I think that's what it was. Uh, what products, at this time I don't want to speak about it. I think at, at a later time I would like to speak about it, but at this time I don't want to speak about what products they are. I think once the filings come to a certain stage, I think we will discuss about that. And uh, uh, reasonable to assume these are for the U.S. market. They are reasonable to assume that uh, for the U.S. market. It's also reasonable to assume that it's a it's a complex centric product. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so second question in the Q1 uh, quarter, we had commented that we expect to file a uh, two to three FTFs by the end of this year. So could you tell tell us where are we in the process? Have we already filed any FTFs? So far this year we filed two FTFs. Uh, one, I think our partner uh, asked us not to disclose the, uh, the name of the product. We've sent some holding off on that. The one we filed by ourselves, I'm going to disclose, uh, is Akla Ibritunov. It's already there in the public domain. There's a couple of articles that have written about it. But again, it's such a competitive market. Even though we filed, I think five other people have filed on the same day. So, uh, I mean, it is what it is. So I think these are two FTFs that we got this year. Sure, sir. So lastly, last question, if I may. Uh, last uh, quarter, we saw in our balance sheet, we have 900 crores of inventory uh, comprising of all molnupiravir, other COVID drugs, and CTPR. Uh, with molnupiravir not picking up so much, uh, uh, what is the kind of inventory that we currently hold in that uh, drug, and do we expect any write-offs from these inventories going ahead? Um... I think there are two inventories we are holding. Uh, so there, we are holding inventory on uh, the agro products, uh, the agro intermediates, which we are carrying in our books uh, because we believe that we'll be able to liquidate them in the uh, in the next uh, next financial year. So that is fine. COVID, yes, I think we are sitting on a lot of inventory. Uh, some we are able to sell, some we are unable to sell. Um, we have to make a call. Uh, I think what I'll do is, I think after March quarter, I think we'll make a call uh, of what we believe we'll be able to liquidate and what we're unable to liquidate. Uh, and I think we'll make a call and we'll speak about it in the next quarter. But you're absolutely right. I think we need to make a call about this inventory. I think we, Molapravir, we did reasonably well in January month. Again, suddenly it collapsed. And we also know that a lot of the market of Molapravir will move to Paxlovid. I think that's also our understanding. And uh, we have a reasonably large COVID portfolio. I mean, this is not the only one. We have, you know, Epixaban, we have Baricitinib, we have this, we have Ampitaricin B, we had chloroquine in the past. So we have a whole bunch of portfolios. So we had to make a call. Uh, but I think uh, in, the, in the March, I think, we'll, uh, I think we'll communicate what call we have taken on this event. Okay? So very helpful. Could you uh, give any sense of what is the total COVID inventory that we hold currently? Uh, I, I don't want to answer that question. I'll, I'll speak about it in the March quarter, running. So I think uh, we, uh, I, can, I can say this much that we have to make a call. Uh, we'll speak about it uh, in the March quarter. Once we make an assessment once the year ends, and basically some of the stock you can sell, some of the stock will have longer dating. So, so I think it's a very complex calculation. See, certain things you believe will be able to sell in about a year's time, then you'll not make a provision. Things that you believe you know, will expire in shorter duration or you don't think has value in so there's a there's a calculation you, you had to sit and make. I, I will not uh, want to guess anything right now. I'll I'll come back uh, for the next quarter earnings and we'll discuss about it. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. I will get back in the queue. Okay, sure. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ritesh Rathod from Nepal, India. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Rani. 
is there any way netco can protect in itself uh, post revlimid launch if there is uh, any kind of litigation uh, pay for delay kind of and we have seen recently in limit uh, where one of the generic competitors i'm sorry to interrupt you mr ratesh but can you please speak louder we cannot hear you and there is a distance is, from your mic also is this better Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, is there any way uh, Netco can protect itself from uh, any sort of litigation post revlimid launch? Uh, we have recently seen in Glimitza where one of the generic peer group uh, peer had to pay uh, for the delay for launch uh, kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, which was a huge amount. So, it, how do you, how do you protect mm -hmm. this profit pool which will be getting you like if, from such litigations which may arise after? Two years or one year of launch. Uh, I think we will legally advise that. I think uh, the deal uh, passes muster. And secondly, Anda is uh, owned by Teva, as you're aware. And I think uh, I think in this this question is better directed at Teva. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Prakash Agarwal from Axis Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my uh, question is one clarification. So the licensing income and uh, the cost that has uh, gone up Q and Q, so they are both uh, related to the same products? Correct. Yes. Okay. So basically you got in a partner who reimbursed those expenses? Yes, correct. Yes. Okay, and uh, I mean, uh, it would be currently under what development stage, or it is nearing filing? Uh, some are filed, and some are in uh, close to filing. Yes, both. Okay, so it's a handful of products, you say? It's uh, it's about three products. Okay, understood. And uh, in terms of you know the big uh, ticket launch, obviously we have Revlimid coming, but uh, and, and then you spoke about couple more, but uh, you know assuming you know Revlimid uh, is a blockbuster for say maybe next 12, 12 months, maybe twenty four months, and maybe thereafter. What are the other known uh, variables we have in terms of bigger products? I think we have uh, been talking about complex filings in the last three four years. Um, in terms of what we are publicly disclosed at this time, I think the first two files we have, I think that they're on our website, and I think that is under the major one. So, I mean, the uh, we have spoken about development, and I think uh, we have so Rapnet, we have uh, you know next hour we have 180 days. Uh, Cartelism, we have 180 days uh, uh, for cup one strength. And other trends we have shared 180 days, uh, and then Improvica is there, and then we have uh, track where we have uh, first to file uh, for the uh, TFOS formulation. Yonder list, which is traveled today, which is our, our JV with fun, we have first to file shared first to file, and then uh, Improvica I think already said. So these are the major ones that we have. They all staggered out. I think we have not disclosed the dates, but these are staggered out in the next uh, few years. So, so our exports seem to be quite on track and with very good, strong growth visibility. I just wanted to understand, uh, you know, outlook for the India business, which has seen some ups and downs. Uh, uh, you know, uh, given that you know, Hep C also down, oncology also down, and now a little bit stabilizing with some COVID portfolio. Uh, so, a, uh, how do we see the growth uh, going forward? What are the steps we are taking? And uh, uh, do we still plan to use some cash to scale up the business, or is there other thought to that? We are, in a way, uh, trying to strengthen our domestic business, and I think uh, we're trying to find uh, an acquisition which can bridge the gap. So we're seriously looking at a branded generic uh, portfolio from uh, uh, to acquire. Now that we have plugged the U.S. front end gap. Now we're looking to uh, plug the uh, gap in the branded generic portfolio as well. So we're looking hard for an acquisition. Hopefully we'll be able to get something in the next few months. I think we're trying very hard. We're looking at two, three acquisitions. Now we have the cash in the books, so, and we are expecting some cash flow in the next few months. So I think we're looking at some opportunities. I think we'll be able to uh, you know, bridge the gap. I think that's where we are. And these would be like uh, you know more like the chronic portfolio that you are looking at, which are more uh, you know 
sustainable or how uh, what are you thinking in terms of building that the most sustainable uh, you know established brands uh, you know which would allow us to you know uh, have more you know predictable uh, you know revenue uh, and that's what we're looking at those type of activities okay and any other areas uh, you are looking at in terms of deployment of the cash uh, that you would be generating over a period of next 12 24 months uh this is probably the biggest one i i think this is what i i want to see uh prakash it's very you know we have something good that's going to happen and we're going to use this cash okay. it lasts however it long it lasts you know i don't want to give any timelines on that but you know we will use this cash wisely to you know up, uh to build a more broader portfolio uh, uh in terms of uh, uh more sustainable and more predictable cash and so i think that's more or less uh, what we're looking at we're looking at different acquisition targets i think once we reach a stage where we are close to an asset i think we can discuss uh, what what we are able to do but i think we're actively looking for it okay and what's the cash balance as on now i mean the net cash december 31st we have a total cash uh including stock of 775 crores and uh, total debt is about uh, if you remove foreign bill discounting which is about 90 crores uh, we have a debt of including that is 300 without the foreign bill discounting it's about 210 crores yeah 210 crore is the uh, debt and 775 crore is the cash Yeah, and if you do formal discount, the debt is three hundred. If you remove formal discounting is against the receivable, so those get negated each other. But uh, actual, you know, what we owe the bank in cash is about two hundred and ten, and uh, and cash on books is about seven seventy five. And this is this is after the dash acquisition. I removed cash from the uh, whatever we have spent on dash. Yeah, and this includes the this Met Plus uh, stake sale yeah. that you have done. Yeah, that is shown in the in the comprehensive income. As you see, my our earnings it's eighty point four, but the gain of the Met Plus is shown in the comprehensive income. If you include the way uh, the Met Plus gain is captured, is captured through the the comprehensive income. So if you include the Met Met Plus share shareholding gain, our profits are one hundred and eight crores this quarter. Okay. And is there any other? Uh, I mean, any uh, remaining stake in Met Plus remaining? I we still have like three lakh twenty five thousand shares of Met Plus sitting in the books and is reflected in the cash balance. Okay, okay, so got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nitin Agarwal from Dam Capital. Please go ahead. Hi Rajiv, uh, just taking forward from the previous questions. Uh, you, know, you talked about the landscape for the US uh, getting tougher, uh, given the fact that our Business model historically has been driven around, built around doing complex filings. Uh, how how do you how do you see the landscape for these kind of opportunities over the next few years? Are there enough of these uh, 50 hundred million dollar opportunities around, or are they very difficult to come by? I mean, how how are you look at it? There are opportunities, Mr. There are. It's harder than before. Obviously, clearly, it is harder. uh and i think uh, there are opportunities i think you need to take a global approach to these opportunities you should not completely bet on the us you need to look at multiple markets so that the r&d expenditure that you're incurring is you know it's spread out over multiple markets so the return on capital is much better uh but the us is hard clearly in it i think us is extremely hard now and i think uh, you need to have a more you know diversified uh, geographical spread I think I think I've been saying this for many years, and I think especially in the last two years, I've been very vocal about this. But right? uh, US as a business model has become extremely difficult, and I think that's why we have you know propped up our other subs. I mean, Brazil and Canada has done extremely well. If you look at our control numbers, you know, uh, significant part of our profitability is coming now from our uh, subs in Brazil and uh, Canada. So, uh, so both the subs have been profitable. so uh you know some of the margins captured in india has spread and some of the margins captured in the you know in the south there so clearly i mean you know this is the way the world is going to be and i think very clearly i think you need to have a strong strategy which takes you out of the us uh, even though you're present in the us you need to have a strong strategy which takes you out of the us otherwise this decade is going to be very hard this is my personal view but yeah 
So, so we'll just sort of take that for a little further. So if you if you say we're talking about a hundred million dollar product hypothetically, where you're saying you need to have a pan uh, you know a pan global strategy. Typically in products like these, uh, you know, how would a split be? How much U.S. would be, for example, a 50% would be U.S., 60% would be U.S., and then you make the balance in the non-U.S. geographies? Or how do you think a opportunities like these will crystallize in general? I mean, how do you want to look at it? No, see, uh, I'll give you an example of, I mean, just giving a simple mathematical example so that you understand. If you look at earlier, people would spend, let's say, let's say $100 on developing a product. They would either do it in India and US, and they would have been very happy because that would cover like, you know, 70, 80 percent of your balance sheet revenue. And as you got these two markets right, you were very happy. But now what has happened is uh, US is not giving you the return that you want. So at least if you leave out US and India, you need to find four or five other countries where you can monetize your asset. What are these countries? Uh, you know, I mean, we found Brazil, we found Canada, and maybe one big Western European country which were not present. And maybe you know a little bit in ROWs, you know, like Indonesia, South Africa type countries. So you need to have a model which diversifies you from India and US, and you include like seven middle-income or high-income countries, yeah, which where you have a reasonable presence, uh, so that whatever you're spending, you get a little more return on your capital. Because if you look at the Indian generic model, it's primarily a US-India driven model, and I think. We need to get out of that and I think build a model which is more global, which is a lot of guys are doing now, I think, but more strongly uh, than before, I think, clearly. I think that's the only way this business is going to work. On uh, China, where are we? Have there been any progress on, on, on our China initiatives? I, we are not having front end in China or we are all doing partnership model there. We have filed about few products. We filed, I think, four or five products. We've not got a single approval. We're expecting at least a couple of approvals this year, but as of now, we don't have an approval. And that's where we are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Yeah. Next caller, please. The next question is from the line of Ravi Purohit from Securities Investment Management. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. Questions have been answered. Thank you. Sorry. All my questions have been answered. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, right. next, next caller, please. The next question is from the line of Shivram from Masterminds Enterprises. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for giving me a chance. Um, Rajiv, uh, have you signed any contracts with, um, you know, for Rebel Mid in Canada, which are definitive and long term? First question. I love the next question. I, I, I didn't understand your question, Shivram. Could you say that question? Could you rephrase the question one more time, please? So there is some news about Natco signing uh, long-term contracts with Government of Canada for the supply of Re Revel Mint. Uh, can you confirm uh, if that is true? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we, the, our guys sign different contracts at different uh... Okay, all right. And um, there is also, uh, and uh, have, Sorry to interrupt. Have, Please stay connected. The line of the management got disconnected. आपण ज्या व्यक्ती सोबत बोलत आहात त्या व्यक्तीने आपला कॉल होल्डवर ठेवला आहे कृपया लाईनवर राहा लेडीज अँड जेंटलमॅन थँक यू फॉर पेशंटली होल्डिंग अ लाईन द मॅनेजमेंट लाईन इज रिकनेक्टेड थँक यू अँड ओव्हर टू यू सर आई अपॉलॉजाइज फॉर डिस्कनेक्ट आई थिंक द कॉल जस्ट ड्रॉप्ड ऑफ So the question of the gentleman was, uh, have you signed contracts uh, with government of Canada? I think uh, I, Canada works on a provincial basis. I think our guys bid in different provinces and they win different contracts in different different states. Uh, that's how it works in different provinces. Um, I think there's there's like routine tender stuff that happens. I can't specifically say that uh, you know I, top of my head I can't recollect. Uh, which particular problems they won some they have lost so I, but i think this is uh, this is something that happens on a routine basis 
that makes sense? Is that answer your yes, question? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, that, that. Thank you. Yeah. Next question. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nikhil from SIMPL. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, good morning. Uh, Rajiv, one question just uh, on the US uh, part. Uh, when you said that uh, doxorubicin was contributing almost to 100 crores on a yearly basis and now that has dropped off, even if I do a back of envelope and uh, say add 25, 30 crores and remove the licensing income, it seems the new launches which we did in uh, Canada and uh, Affinitor and 180 day with Zotress and everything, the number seems to be pretty low as compared to what uh, we were even thinking in Q3. So has there been a significant uh, execution fallouts or is my no, understanding wrong? Brands are done well. See, also what happens is based on the surplus we have, we plan expenditure also. Right? So I think that's what it is. And I think we have done, you know, for example, we ran two first to files the last quarter. And uh, so there's a significant amount of R&D expenditure. So I think that's the reason why you see basically what you do is you look at the surplus that you have in this particular year and then you budget how much surplus you're going to have based on that you plan your expenditure if you believe that you're going to have let's say 100 rupees of surplus then you say okay fine i'm going to spend 30 rupees or 40 rupees on you know r d which i'll expense in my balance sheet and that's the reason why for example you know you know this particular product that we out licensed if we expense that completely on our balance sheet, then the what it called the the then we would have we would have had a loss in the quarter. So I think you need to make those calls all the time, and I think based on the uh, uh, you know um, uh, I mean the surplus you make these decisions. So uh, Rajiv, sorry uh, sorry to interrupt. I was more focusing on the revenue side. So we have reported a 383 crores on the export business, including the license income and everything. And during the call, you said that some of the products like Dr. Ubisin had seen a significant price erosion. Even if I just add back those numbers and set off the license income, considering the launches which we did in Q3, uh, like Revlimit Canada and Affinitor, uh, it seems the uh, numbers are, are they completely in the books in terms of profit sharing and everything? Or is it like it's not completely reflected in our revenue? That's where I'm trying to understand. What do you mean? I uh, reflected in the book on profit sharing and yeah, no, everything is reflected. All the profit shares are reflected. See, every limits that we are selling uh, in Canada and all, and Lenormand are reflected in our books directly. There's no sharing of revenue, you know. So, so, so it seems our market share in Revlimit Canada and even in the products FTF and other products which we launched seems to be pretty low, or either the price competition is too high as compared to what we were thinking. We could be building in in terms of the revenue. No, development has just been launched. No, I mean uh, the, the the product has been launched only last quarter. No, and even Everolimus also has been launched recently only. No. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, the market share reflection uh, will come uh, as we go along. Uh, in terms of see, I mean to answer your question, I think Everolimus and Lendermind is what is driving the export business right now. Uh, the Everly Limits Epic Note is what is driving the export business. And Lelinamite Canada is, uh, is helping Canada's, uh, you know, uh, driving Canada's profitability. Uh, to answer your question about uh, price erosion, price erosion is the nature of the beast. I mean, you can't really do much about that. It's not in my control. And I think uh, uh, in terms of market share, I think we have reasonable market share. I think uh, Somebody has specifically asked me what is the market share on these numbers. I said I can't come back because we just been launched. I think we'll give more color to it as we come uh, one, in the next quarter. I think we'll have more clarity about our market share. So the, the data basically don't get updated within three months of the uh, the launch. It takes a little more time. Okay. Sure. Sure. Lastly, uh, on domestic side, in one of the participant question, you said that uh, we will have to broaden out our uh, therapy areas. And you mentioned that one is acquisitions which we are looking at, but parallelly, are we looking at something organically developing ourselves or uh, would the focus of new therapy addition be completely through inorganic route? Both, both organic and inorganic. So anything in the next one year in terms of organic side? Any new therapy area or division? We're sticking to these divisions only. I think we have some ideas. Uh, typically, we don't reveal the pipeline on a call. Uh, so yes, when we launch, we kind of, you know, articulate what our pipeline is. 
Okay. Sure, thanks. I'll come back. Excellent. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahul Veera from Abacus. Please go ahead. Oh, hi, Rajiv. Uh, again, now coming back to if you consider X of the licensing income with an EBIT of 70 to 80 crores, uh, what will be the share of US within this? I mean, just trying to understand because there will be limited contribution from the Tamiflu this season. So we're just seeing the base erosion in uh, Doxil or Copax and NASA. What is the contribution of US you're saying and what's the contribution of India in EBITDA is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. I don't have that number of uh, split I don't have. Okay, okay. And uh, again, going back to the previous participation, uh, participants' question, uh, all the launches, Revolimus or Revolimus, are, is there a front-loading of cost in the number and probably uh, the profit share will come from a higher profit share will start flowing in with a better market share next quarter? Is something that is what we are expecting? No, I'm not expecting. I think we're fairly the numbers are the way they are. And I think if you get more market share, then you get more sales and more profit share. But there's always pressure uh, in uh, See, it's very tough to judge. I mean, what you're asking me is to predict uh, revenue in the next few months uh, for products where there's a significant number of competition. I, honestly, I can't answer your question. I, we just have to go with the flow, and I think I can speak about it as things go along. Uh, I can't make any prediction such of, of revenue. Um, sure, fair point. So in terms of uh, Copaxone, Doxil, and Phosphorinol, are we making any substantial money there as of now? Copaxone we're making. Copaxone is still our number one product uh, So uh, in terms of revenue. Uh, what's the other one you said? Doxil is down quite a bit. Doxil is down 80% down compared to what we used to make before. Uh, Lanternum, uh, we make reasonable amount of money, but I, from what I understand, there are two other generic competitors that bought a code last month. So I think that's where we are on those two products. Sure. I think Cipla and uh, Reflecteva, I think both of them got approved just, uh, I think, in June and January, I think, is what I understand. Right, right. And so one of our peers in Time Flu has written off a lot of inventory uh, because of the. Uh, uh, Expiry dates, you know, so are we seeing that pressure falls also on the time flu side? Um, our contribution from time flu has been low, but as I said, I, I said we'll make a call in the March quarter on uh, the COVID inventory. I think we'll make a call. Uh, we will speak about it in the March quarter. Yeah. So time flu, I'm talking about <laughs> I, I said all inventory will make a call in March quarter now that, uh, you know, that the COVID uh, wave is over. So I think uh, we'll make a call in the March quarter. Basically, you make different provisions based on your dating of your product. So we will make a call in the March quarter based on how the portfolio is moving. Sure. So, sir, we are, I mean, as of now, whatever we spoke in the past one hour, it seems like whatever the profit that is going to be, we will be generating via revelment is going to be set off by all the write-offs now. <laughs> See, my friend, I think what I can tell you is that, see, the numbers are the way they are, right? You can't, uh, you know, I, we, uh, we, we, what we're communicating is the nature of the business. And uh, beyond that, I don't know, I, you know, so we, that's how it works. So what I can tell you is about strategy. I can't tell you why you're not getting better realization on this product because it's the nature of the beast, isn't it? So, and I think it is also very clear. I think the development is going to drive up profits clearly. I think that's the way it is. And uh, there's no two ways of hiding behind it. I think it is what it is. Sure, sure. Fair point, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Chirag Dagli from DSP Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Yeah, Rajiv, thank you for the opportunity. Rajiv, this is a slightly, you know, higher level question. Um, if you look at pre copaxon FY16 uh, and versus, you know, let's say the annualized run rate currently, we had roughly moved 1,000 crore sales to about 1,600 crores uh, and EBITDA from 250, 260 crores to 360-odd crores. Right. Of course, over the last five years, we've accrued reserves. But pre copaxon versus now, uh, the base business has, you know, uh, not moved materially. Um, and we are again at a juncture where, uh, you know, we are going to get windfall gains from another large product uh, rev limit in the U.S. So the question there is, uh, you know, how different do you think the next five years are going to be for the base business versus the last five years? 
I think, see, uh, if we look at our journey over the last five, six years, so we had windfall gains in both Tamiflu, we had windfall gains in Capaxon, and we're anticipating, you know, some gains in development. So that's the nature of our, the, our way the business works, isn't it? So we've had the ability to deliver something every, uh, you know, every few, uh, few years, which has allowed us to do something special. Uh, you know, I mean, Doc Hill did well for a while it was there. But that's the nature of the beast. I mean, the, the, the business, uh, you know, if you have a smart idea, you do very well with it. And, uh, and, and, you, and you, it holds on for a while and then it goes away. You just have to come up with a new idea. I think that's how it works. So uh, and that's, I think that's, that's where we are. So in terms of, uh, you know, how the future holds, I think we are very acutely aware that we need to strengthen the base business. I think, uh, I mean, this is something we've been working on for the last two, three years. I think Brazil and Canada edition is part of that. We have built that business from scratch organically. Building a business organically takes six to seven years, and I think we went through that journey in these markets. And, uh, you know, our agro core is also part of that so that we can diversify our revenue so that we're not so highly dependent on one-offs from the U.S. market. I think this is what we've been working on continuously. The benefit of that you'll see in the next few years. I think by the time, uh, you know, you know, development tapers off in the U.S., I think we would have built uh, a large enough businesses in all these segments so that when it tapers off, the base continues to be strong. I think that's continuously our endeavor, and this is what we've been working on. But when you try to build things organically, you won't see results like overnight. If you say, Rajiv, next quarter you show me 300 crores in a non-US uh, uh, revenue uh, in this particular market, it doesn't happen like that, you know. It, it takes time. See, a lot of the articulation that we do in terms of, you know, aggro and all that, you know, it's a process. I mean, I, what I can tell you is that, like, this is what we're doing, and this is what we believe will launch and happen. This will happen in this particular month. So, and based on this particular event. So I think, to answer your question, I think this is what we've been working on. I think we are very conscious of what you said. And I think it, it uh, you know, uh, we're very clear that, uh, that this has to be done. And I, I think we're working uh, towards that. And I believe by the time rev limit goes away, I think we'd have built these business to a significant size so that the, uh, the base is much stronger. Un understood. And just the second one uh, on CTPR, uh, uh, how many uh, do we have approvals across multiple uh, crops, etc.? Because I understand this product is sold across multiple uh, crops. Do we have, do we need approval for all the crops uh, before we start scaling up? I I don't want to hazard a guess on that one, but I think we have approval for multiple crops. I think that's what I understand. Is, is that right? Yeah. When we register, it is uh, applied for the multiple crops, uh, Chirag. So we can we can immediately access the entire 1400 crores market uh, yes, in India. Yes, I think that's my understanding. Yes. Understood. Okay. Thank you so much. Best of luck. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kunal Randeria from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Yeah, Rajiv. Thanks for taking my question again. Uh, Rajiv, just building upon you know one of the previous participants' question on complex genetics. So it's not as if, you know, there are a dearth of products in the U.S., right? Some of the U.S. companies have actually revealed their pipeline, right? Uh, you know, products like Risp uh, Risperdal, Consta, Sandostatin, LAR, and Invegat, and so on. So I'm just wondering, where, why is it that, uh, you know, a lot of Indian companies which were developing it have not been able to sort of develop this? Because these can be very lucrative long-term opportunities. Um. Okay, I'll answer your question. Why do we are not revealing the five cents? So revealing and all you don't reveal at the time in R&D. Uh, you only reveal it when you reach the stage of uh, filing. If you've done the clinical, you've done the filing with the A&D, that's when people start revealing. What, they don't never, nobody reveals at the time of the R&D, uh, you know, because it's only an idea, right? So unless you execute your idea, you don't reveal it. Uh, that is one. Second is uh, your question, why don't Indian companies are, are not successful in complex index as opposed to U.S. you're saying? Is that the question? Is yeah, I mean, one? at least in some of these products, right? I, I remember, you know, uh, uh, for Sender Saturn, for example, a lot of the Indian companies are trying to develop, I think, in the last five years. Well, I think it, these are very tough to deliver, uh, Kunal. I think that's what you need to appreciate. I think they're very hard to deliver. And... Uh, and when, uh, when they come through, obviously there's a huge upside, but it takes a lot of time to deliver. If you're able to pull off like two of these products in a decade, you've done a great job, you know. Uh, I mean, look at our own capacity success. I mean, you know, we've done it 10 years before the actual launch actually happened. And now, you know, it's a fairly stable revenue stream for us. 
So these are very hard to deliver, Kunal. It's not easy as uh, you know I've said. But everybody has their own. I mean, everybody has their own complex enriched pipeline. So I, again, you know, I, uh, again we're privy to you know what is publicly said. I think Indian companies also doing that. I don't say that they're not doing it, but success is very hard to come by. I think clearly it's not easy. Sure, and I, I, I'm not sure if you reveal this, but uh, you know, would you be sort of comfortable making you know a domestic acquisition in excess of let's say 2,000, 2,500 crore, given the kind of cash flows you will be generating in the next few years? I'm open. I'm open to every, any transaction, Kunal. But as long as it is right for the company, right? I, I don't want. You know, we should do what is right. Uh, we need to fill the, the gaps in our pipeline, as the gentleman asked me earlier. But you know, we need to use uh, uh, this cash in a way that we, where we are able to fill the pipeline, and with strength in the base business. I think at the right valuation, at the right price, at the right synergy, I think uh, I'm open to any transaction. Got it. Thanks a lot, Rajiv. Okay. We'll take one final question and wrap it up. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sai Pavan Kumar from an individual investor. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, Rajiv. This is Swarapani Sai. I'm an uh, individual investor in Natco for the past couple of years. So my question is, um, uh, you know, uh, what I've understood from the other, uh, you know, uh, almost my queries got answered, but one, one question I have, sir, uh, futuristic. Uh, like, uh, you know, uh, next financial year, we're going to have very good revenues from the Revelmed US. So, uh, and you also said that the base of the business you're going to strengthen uh, by the time uh, Revelmed gets phased off, or you may have, and you also have sta staggered launches going forward in a couple of years. So can I assume that, you know, uh, the revenue, what we're going to see in the next financial year is sustained for a couple of years, maybe next uh, three to five years, sir? That's a question I can't answer, uh, honestly, Pawan. I don't know. But we're hoping it will hold up for a bit. Uh, it's a reasonable opportunity. I think let's see how it plays out. Uh, maybe, how many years, or maybe two, three years we can, maybe down the line, or two years. I, I, I will never make a, a definitive time uh, commitment on how long it will hold up. It will be a good thing. It will hold up for a while. Again, uh, you know, again, I can't judge what the market dynamics are. The, the, I think that's all I can say. I, uh, I, but what uh, the question I can answer is, what will I do with the money? I think uh, the question I would like to answer is that. And I think clearly we have to use this money in a, a judicious manner, which uh, which allows us to strengthen our base business. I think that's essentially where we are at this time. Yeah. Okay. Good, sure, sir, and all the best, sir. Okay, thank, right. thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you all. Oh. Thank you. Right. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Again, uh, the transcripts will be up when it's available. Um, thank you all again. Have a good day. Thank you. On behalf of Investor Capital Services, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.